Hello, upgraders, and welcome to another edition of the Upgraded Ape Show. I'm your host, Will Barron, and on today's show, we have Sam Vaknin, who is an expert on narcissists, psychopaths, and has been diagnosed with both conditions. Absolutely fascinating talk. Sam is an absolute wealth of knowledge in this area, and we're talking about how you can recognize narcissists and psychopaths in the workplace, and then what you can then go on to do to one, stop them bullying or manipulating you and two perhaps manage them better if you're a manager or how to survive working underneath them. What fascinated me about all this is that the literature suggests that one percent of people in the western world are either narcissists or psychopaths. However most psychopaths for example don't know that they're a psychopath because they think that they're fine, they think that they're great. So that one percent is actually a tiny amount so it's very likely that you have friends or family or colleagues that are narcissists or psychopaths. And all this is on a sliding scale from, you know, Hannibal Lecter to the boss who likes attention and who is stealing credit for your work. So that's something to bear in mind. And Sam is the editor of Mental Health Disorders in the Open Directory Project. He's got a book out, Malignant Self-Love, and his work has been featured on Mental Health Matters, Mental Health Sanctuary, Mental Health Today, Mental Health Review, and loads of other websites and publications. So just before we get into the show, exciting news in that you can now download Upgraded It magazine directly to your iOS device, so your iPhone or your iPad. If you just go into the App Store, type in Upgraded It magazine, you'll see it there, download, wham bam, and it's yours. Every week you'll get a little notification that tells you that the latest edition is available and yeah, just click download and you view and you can just swipe through it and it's it's actually a way better experience reading the magazine on the iPhone or iPad versus in your browser how it is at the moment. So yeah, go check that out. It's totally free and let's jump into today's show. Welcome to the Upgraded Ape Show, your daily dose of brain upgrades to help you kick life's ass. And here's your host, Will Barron. Hi, Sam, and welcome to the Upgraded Ape Show. Thank you for having me. You are more than welcome, and today we're going to dive into the fascinating world of narcissism and psychopaths. And just before we dive into that, and we're going to talk about it in the context of the workplace, can you tell us a definition of what a narcissist and a psychopath is, just for listeners to clarify what we're going to talk about? The distinction between narcissists and psychopaths has gradually become more and more blurred. And today it is thought that a psychopath may be simply an extreme form of narcissist. Psychopaths are more prone to anti antisocial behavior, including criminal conduct. They are less empathic than narcissists, if at all possible. They are more centered on their benefits, on on tangible benefits that they may derive from people and from situations, anything from sexual favors to money to the accumulation of power to the exercise of power, etc., etc. Psychopaths are also a bit more enamored, a bit, a bit uh, more addicted to inflicting pain on other people. They find it pleasurable and some of them even find it funny. Narcissists are a mellowed version of a psychopath. They also lack empathy, they are exploitative, but they are addicted to input from other people, input which we call narcissistic supply, which essentially is attention, whether positive or negative. Narcissists, of course, prefer admiration and adulation to notoriety, but if they cannot obtain the positive kind of attention, then they would definitely go for the negative kind of attention. So while psychopaths are stand-alone units, they are totally autonomous and they are not reliant nor are they dependent on anyone for anything, narcissists are. Narcissists are addicted to narcissistic supply and therefore they are addicted to the input provided by people around them. They go and solicit this input actively and sometimes forcefully. So these are the distinction between the two types, but both of them are callous, ruthless, disempathic, emotionless, and pretty terrifying. <laughs> okay, well, before we dive into how to spot these people and whether that whether it's good or bad and the sliding scale of how narcissistic and how psychopathic you can be, can you just tell us some, a little bit how you got involved in this world in the first place? 
Well, I've been diagnosed with both. I'm a narcissist and a psychopath. And having confronted my own diagnosis multiply, I've decided to delve into the, uh, into the issue. And in 1997, when I started my, 1995 actually, when I started my work on, on these topics, it was personality disorders in general and narcissistic and antisocial personality disorders in particular were an obscure and neglected sub 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 field of expertise among a very limited set of scholars. Narcissists and psychopaths are very hateful and difficult patients. They do not uh, yield to authority nor do they improve with treatment. So they are very disappointing and resilient subjects, both for study and for therapy. And so psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists tend to avoid narcissists and psychopaths. In 1995, there has been nothing, absolutely nothing written about this disorder, with the exception of one or two books. And uh, so I had, I had to do, you know, I have to start everything from scratch. And I've spent the last 20 years studying both disorders, coming up with a vocabulary that is widely used today, actually, and uh, suggesting insights, some of them accepted, some of them rejected, with regards to these two afflictions. I have written several books, the most well-known of which I believe is Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, but I've written other books as well about personality disorders. And I have corresponded and observed thousands of narcissists, people diagnosed officially with narcissistic personality disorder, and with hundreds of thousands of family members, neighbors, colleagues, bosses, co-workers, you name it. <laughs> so by now, by now I probably have, it would be safe to say that I have the largest database with regards to these uh, aliens among us. For sure, for sure. That's fascinating, Sam. And one question that comes to my mind listening back to you then was how and why did you go to get a formal diagnosis in the first place? Is this something that you'd noticed the traits of narcissism and psychopathy in yourself or had someone else mentioned them to you? I've been coerced twice into, <laughs> into evaluation. Once by my then fiancé, who had the wits and the intelligence to bail out. And uh, <laughs> second time in prison, I did time for securities fraud. And as a condition for parole, I, was, I had to commit myself to psychiatric evaluation. So on both occasions, the verdict of narcissistic personality disorder was rendered in conjunction with one or two other personality disorders. And then about four or five years ago, I participated in a documentary titled I Psychopath, in which quite publicly I was diagnosed with psychopathy. They used a test called the PCL, PCLR, a test concocted by one Robert Hare. And while there are, there's a serious debate about the validity of the test, for instance, it is not accepted by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Committee, which is the body, the body of orthodoxy in psychiatry, but still, it's indicative. And so it would be safe to say that I'm a psychopathic narcissist after all these luminaries have poured over my record and, and myself multiply. Mm -hmm. But I've been coerced into, and that's an important question actually what you've asked, I've been coerced into, into evaluation and coerced into treatment and therapy. You see, prior to, prior to being confronted with my diagnosis, I was completely unself-aware. I... I would have found it pretty funny had you suggested to me that something's wrong with me. I would have thought that you are dim-witted. I would have ascribed pernicious and paranoid motives and motivations to you for having said it, mm -hmm. for having suggested that something's wrong with me. I would have blamed everyone and anything for my misfortunes and defeats and, and so on. And we call this whole thing alloplastic defenses. Alloplastic defenses, better known as external locus of control, means simply that narcissists and psychopaths, before they become self-aware, and some of them do, I'm, I'm an example, but before they become self-aware, psychopaths and narcissists tend to blame everyone and everything for the mishaps and the misfortunes 
and the downfalls in their lives. They can do nothing wrong, nor do, do, nor do they ever do anything wrong. Everyone else is to blame. The boss is envious of them. Their co-workers are jealous of them and undermine them. No one appreciates them properly. The universe is badly designed. God is to blame. Society, the, stu- the increasing stupidity of the populace, you name it. <laughs> the waiter, the cabbie, the, I mean, everyone, it was, with one exception, the narcissist himself. And this is called alloplastic defense, a defense mechanism which shifts the blame and the responsibility and the attendant guilt feeling to the outside in order to avoid an inner conflict. I think we all know people who don't accept blame themselves and blame other people for things that are going on in their life and struggle to take responsibility. But what percentage of the population are actually, I guess, clinically narcissists or psychopaths? Is this a big amount or is this the, a very small minority? According to the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published in June 2013, last year, I mean, about a year and something ago, uh, about 1% of the population uh, would qualify as suffering from narcissistic personality disorder. But this is, of, this is obviously a massive underestimate. And the reason that it is an underestimate is that narcissists rarely subject themselves mm-hmm. either to psychological testing or to a therapeutic setting. So it's very difficult to come across narcissists in a scholarly environment <laughs> or in a therapeutic environment. And so narcissism is heavily and massively underestimated. Not so psychopathy. Psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, I believe, is pretty well measured. The prevalence and the incidence of antisocial personality disorder, I believe, is, is accurately reflected in the literature. And the reason is very simple. Many psychopaths end up in jail, end up in prison. So there they are subjected to compulsory evaluations, assessments, and sometimes therapy. Indeed, Robert Hare, the father and mother of modern, the modern study of psychopathy, is actually a prison psychiatrist. His bulk of his career he had spent in prisons where he studied this population. But narcissists are a lot more insidious, a lot more stealth, a lot more, they act by proxy. They are great, they have great thespian skills. They're great actors. They are, they know how to adapt themselves so that they appear to be socially acceptable pillars of the community. Indeed, many of them climb up the corporate ladder or politics or show business or the judiciary, or law enforcement, or the clergy, and end up in positions of authority. Sam, let's dive into that a little bit further then, because that 1% that you said was an underestimate, I thought that was a quite high number, yes, uh, not uh, knowing as, as much about it as you, obviously. And 1% would suggest that you, most people would definitely know someone who's narcissistic, but if it's higher than that, then it's likely that you know, either family members or definitely people that you work with if you work in a big big organization are going to be afflicted with this. So if we look at a stereotypical organization now so they can relate this to their workplace, are we talking about management that are more likely to be narcissistic or is it likely to be the CEOs of company or is it salespeople? Is there a specific part of the company that tends to have more narcissistic people than others? With your, with your kind permission, before I answer your question, I would like to, to make two comments. One, yeah, narcissism is only partly a mental health diagnosis, a mental, mental health construct. It is equally influenced by culture and society. It is what we call a culture-bound syndrome. Mm-hmm. It tends to increase in societies which are narcissistic or which reward narcissism. So societies which would place emphasis on individualism, on ambition, on trampling on other people, you know, Darwinistic societies, societies which would uh, emphasize competition and ruthlessness and so on and so forth would tend to reward narcissists. And in these societies, people would become narcissistic. Indeed, there is a suggested diagnosis by Professor Millman of Harvard University 
situational narcissism, narcissism which is provoked and, and engendered by circumstances. So this is comment number one. In societies such as the United States, for instance, uh, countries such as the United States, it would stand to reason that narcissism is more prevalent, more visible, and more widespread than in, let us say, Japan, which is a collectivist society. That's one thing. Second, second comment I would like to I would like to make: narcissism or pathological narcissism is rarely diagnosed alone. It is usually comorbid. In other words, it's diagnosed with other mental health disorders, mood disorders, other personality disorders, and so on. So one might one comes across narcissists whose main complaint or whose main syndrome or symptom is not narcissism. Prime example would be borderline personality disorder, which is ex with extremely accentuated narcissistic dimensions. So narcissism is not an isolated phenomenon. It, it, I think a good case can be made that pathological narcissism is the foundation of myriad other mental health problems. So these are the two comments. As to your question, narcissists tend to, tend to gravitate towards positions of authority because there they can exercise power and extract, not to say extort, narcissistic supply, attention, adulation, admiration from their surroundings, human surroundings. They need this input of narcissistic supply. It is both a drug, a drug and, a f and fuel to their machinery. In the absence of narcissistic supply, they crumble, crumble and crumple, and go to dust. So they would tend to gravitate to these positions of authority, but if they fail to gravitate, if they fail to reach these positions, I'm sorry, if they fail to reach these positions, they would opt for second best. And second best is to become minions and psychophants and fans and admirers and followers and subscribers to those in power. So you can find them actually uh, most represented in these two positions, either as the figures of authority, imposing authority on others and thereby enhancing their own feelings of omnipotence and grandiosity, or by serving as satellites, as extensions of people. Hello? Mm -hmm. yeah, You're still there. As satellites yeah. or extensions of people uh, in, in positions of authority, and thereby deriving their narcissistic supply by proxy, if you wish. Indeed, mm -hmm. the second type of narcissist that I've just described, the satellite or the extension, is known as covert narcissist or inverted narcissist. It's a narcissist who is very much like the moon. He, he shines, but with reflected light. And it is the reflected light of the sun, the main narcissist, the one who is in power. So these are the two. It's very rare to find narcissists in, you know, uh, low-level, long-term low-level occupations and so on. If they are completely unable to reach the top, they would tend, tend to be itinerant. They would tend to be desultory. They would tend to hop from one job to another, from one position to another. They would change... 40 careers in the span of 20 years, mm -hmm. attempting to reach the top somewhere, somehow. From then a, a business and workplace perspective then, what traits do narcissists have that are actually positive for the business? Because it seems like some things like if, you, if you're if you willing to trample on others to get to the top, that might not be necessarily positive. But if you're willing if you know that the reward in attention is there at the end, you might be willing to put in way more work than someone who isn't potentially narcissistic. Is that about right? Intuitively, it sounds right. But the correct response is counterintuitive. Pathological narcissism is never, ever good for business. Now, what I've just said is not accepted by some scholars, such as Kevin Dutton and others, Maccabi, these scholars claim that narcissism can be harnessed and can be put to good use within the corporate structure, and that the drive of the narcissist, his 
in irrevocable energy. His uh, neediness and addiction to narcissistic supply and so on and so forth are actually energies that could be channeled and, and leveraged for the benefit of the organization. And that is a serious, serious mistake in thinking and a serious misrepresentation of case studies. Uh, narcissists are very good as entrepreneurs. They are charismatic usually. They are intelligent. They are driven. They have clear goals. And they motivate people around them, either in the form of a cult, cult-like setting, or in preferring a vision, a common vision, and we call this shared psychosis, kind of a hypnotic, psychotic state into which everyone else buys. Mm -hmm. And so they are good at inducing these pretty pathological states. And they are therefore good at building up businesses, at gobbling up businesses through mergers and acquisitions. They are very good at creating teams, putting teams together on condition that they, had, they are you know, at, the, at the helm and they are mm -hmm. the chiefs of these teams. They are very bad team players, but they are very good team builders. And so on and so forth. However, Narcissists invariably implode. Ultimately, all narcissists, without a single exception, are self-destructive. They would put 20 years into a business, they would build it up into a global conglomerate, but then their self-destructiveness will come into play, and they will, and it will all come tumbling down. Why narcissists are self-destructive is perhaps outside the remit of this program. But it, it is a given. Narcissists are self-destructive in a variety of ways. They are very inventive. They are very inventive in the way that they extract narcissistic supply from people, and they are equally inventive in the ways in which they self-destruct, implode, and ruin everything and everyone around them. But they invariably do. Perhaps an excellent example would be Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, who was remote diagnosed as a narcissist by Eric Fromm, a prominent psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. uh, Adolf Hitler has succeeded to build out of the ashes and the ruins of the First World War, having come, having appeared on the scene, having burst on the scene literally from nowhere and with zero credentials and achievements to his name, this nobody succeeded to put up together a formidable, a formidable war machine involving an empire the likes of which the world has not seen since Alexander the Great. Now, and he has done all that in less than a decade. Mm -hmm. Yet we all know how it ended. So they are great in the phase of construction. Unfortunately, they are also unequaled in the phase of destruction. So I've mused about Adolf Hitler before, and this is a slightly going off topic, I guess, um, from the business world, but... I've 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 thought and contemplated that perhaps if he hadn't done uh, and gone into the role that he did, because obviously he was an artist beforehand, and he, he could, from some things he could have been an entrepreneur, he could have been anything. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that whatever he'd done, even if it had been for the good of mankind rather than um, you know what what he did end up doing, that it would have imploded eventually? Now, first of all, for a very long time, everyone thought that he was acting for the good of mankind. I can show you adulating and fawning articles in the British press about Adolf Hitler, not to mention the American press, well into the late 1930s. So his post-mortem assessment, posthumous assessment, as a monster is Victor's history. Throughout most of his life, he, has not, he was not considered a monster at all. He was considered a fresh political talent with innovative, courageous ideas, a rebuilder of his own nation, a reconstructor of the space of Europe, and so on and so forth. It is only when, in, in 1940 that the image has you know, changed. But yes, the answer is yes. Whatever he... Whichever field he would have entered, whichever endeavor he would have embarked upon, 
he would have ended up the same. All narcissists do. All of them do. From Enron to the Third Reich. They all do. Okay, so let's put this into context for the listener then. Listeners listening, they work in the corporate environment and their boss fits perfectly to the role and the aspects of a narcissist or a psychopath, which we just talked about. They are constantly claiming that the subordinates work are theirs. They're taking potentially advantage of them in different ways. What is the best way to deal with this situation if you know your boss is a narcissist? Is there a best way to deal with it or is the best way to move to a different place within the company and have different management? Well, best, uh, using the word best is a bit misleading. Best to whom, in which circumstances, depending on one's character as well. The best way is to adulate, admire, adore visibly, volubly, and repeatedly your boss. Brown knows, if you wish to use a less savory experience, uh, the uh, phrase. <laughs> so that, that's the best. The, this, this is the winning tactic. Never fails. Are I you... see, because by doing that, you're, you're stroking their ego, so they're more likely to work with you, and you'll be in their good books by doing that. You're stroking their ego. You're distorting their reality because you're providing them with fallacious feedback. And by doing so, you are in control of, the re of reality. You have information which they are not privy to. And this gives you the, the leverage and the power to manipulate them. And indeed, narcissists are very gullible and easily manipulable. They are junkies. Think junkie. You know, you provide them with the fix, provide them with the dose, they're yours for the taking. So this is the, the winning and only viable long-term strategy of survival around the narcissist and, and in the work environment. However, very few people are either willing or able to countenance, let alone implement such a strategy because it requires you to some extent to possess psychopathic and narcissistic traits of your own. Well, that is what I was just about to ask in that it's a fascinating twist in that speaking to yourself as a narcissist, you're telling me how to manipulate other narcissists, which leads me to the question then of, do you then get to a point within the corporate structure where you get a higher and higher percentage of narcissists because they're the only people that are willing to manipulate and play the game with each other? Yes, yes, that's precisely what I've said. I've said that narcissists tend to gravitate and, and, conglom and conglomerate and accumulate in the upper strata, that means in positions of authority, and in the satellites and extensions mm -hmm. around them. So yes, uh, level C and a bit down. The, these would be narcissists. Narcissists are rarely found in the lower echelons or in the lower levels of the, of the corporation. They gravitate up. They, they are like scum, you know. They go to the top. <laughs> well, Sam, I've got two questions for you. One question that I ask everyone who comes on the show, which I'll ask you in a second. But before that, just to wrap things up here, you mentioned the PCLR test that um, may or may not be the best test to look at this. But if a member of the audience now, and me included, if you feel like you have some of these traits that we've talked about, what's the best way to go about uh, like an initial kind of test before you'd speak to a doctor or, or psychiatrist, whoever, who could give you a clinical diagnosis. Is there a test that you can do perhaps online or from a book that would give you a heads up as to how narcissistic or psychopathic you are? No, not really. Because all these tests, both online and offline, regrettably, require self-reporting, honest self-reporting. And no matter how honest you think you are, especially if you're a narcissist, you're not. <laughs> so, honest, yeah. honest self, it's a self-defeating proposition. It's uh, like the famous Abdera paradox, you know, all, all Abderians are, are liars. And who says that, an Abderian? So is he lying <laughs> or is he telling the truth? So self-reporting is a problem. And this is the main obstacle in diagnosing narcissists and psychopaths, because ultimately we have to rely on their honest self-reporting and the self-reporting of people around, and the reporting of people around them who are usually scared of them, or uh -huh. would like to avoid them, or would say anything just to obtain certain outcomes. So it's very difficult to diagnose them. But there are tests designed in order to circumvent self-reporting. 
So we have a test such as the MMPI-2, uh, which is a dimensional, very complex test and very difficult to beat, even if you know the test intima intimately. So that would be my recommendation, my, the first line, MMCI, MMPI-2 and perhaps uh, MCMI-3. These are the two tests that I would... The, other, the, the most common test used to diagnose narcissists, the narcissistic personality inventory, is idiotic, sorry for being blunt, because it requires <laughs> the narcissist to self-report honestly, unflinchingly, and to be self-aware. So this borders on, on <laughs> inanity. So, uh, uh, and the second, the second way is with a trained observer, diagnostician, who is a trained observer, has been exposed to hundreds of cases, and is able through a structured interview and through direct observations of body language, demeanor, reaction, reactivity, and so on and so forth in a therapeutic city, setting, after several sessions, reached a conclusion that perhaps we are dealing with a narcissist and perhaps not. So it's a process. Diagnosing a narcissist is a process, especially taking into account that narcissists have developed, over the years, have developed numerous stratagems to hide and disguise the less savory aspects of their personality. They have been exposed to a lot of censure, a lot of social rejection and criticism as they were growing up. So they have learned to disguise, disguise who they are. And they apply that in a therapeutic setting. But after several sessions, a trained diagnostician, with or without structured interviews and, and with or without applying psychological tests, such as the MMPI, would still be able to say if someone is a narcissist or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, Sam, just before we come on to you, tell us a little bit about your book and where the audience can learn more about you and your work. I've got one final question for you, and that's something I've asked everyone who's come on the show so far. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be one piece of advice you'd give him to help him upgrade his brain? In my case? Uh-huh. I benefit mightily from my dysfunction. Uh, we are talking to each other because I'm dysfunctional and disordered. So I have, I have leveraged and, and applied and used my disorder, my dysfunction and my ruination um, in order to obtain the very narcissistic supply that I require. <laughs> Narcissists are... Yeah. Uh, Narcissists would be unable constitutionally to respond to the question that you've asked because they are emotionally invested in their disorder. They are very happy with it. They are what we call in psychology egosyntonic, means they're comfortable with their disorder. They aid and abet the disorder, and the disorder aids and abets them. It's a partnership, a symbiosis. So nothing's wrong with it. Nothing could ever be wrong with it, retroactively or prospectively. Amazing. Well, Sam, your your insights are absolutely fascinating to me. And Thank you. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about your book, Malignant Self Love, where we can find where we can find it, where we can find it? Yeah, sorry. Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited is available, of course, via Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I think your first stop, if you want to get acquainted with my work and more generally narcissism and psychopathy and so on, the first stop mm, might well be in, in my YouTube channel. That's Sam Vaknin, my name, S-A-M-V-A-K-N-I-N. So youtube.com backslash Sam Vaknin. There are well over 300 videos there, and I believe you'll find your match. And uh, then my book... Malignant Self Love Narcissism Revisited, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and my website, which is narcissistic abuse.com. Just type my name into Google. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with some results. Well, Sam, I really appreciate your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, and we'll link to all of them in the show notes at radio.upgradedape.com for anyone who is in the car or at the gym at the moment. And Sam, I just want to thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. And thank you for coming on the Upgraded Ape Show. Thank you for having me.